The day before Thanksgiving in 1971, a man identifying himself as Dan Cooper bought a plane ticket from Portland to Seattle. He hijacked the plane, claiming he had a bomb in his briefcase and demanded $200,000 in four parachutes. He jumped out of the plane with the money and the bomb somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, never to be seen again. The FBI claims to have investigated over a thousand people, including dozens of deathbed confessions. In 2016, 45 years after the hijacking, the FBI suspended its investigation of the case. While the FBI is no longer looking for D.B. Cooper, there is a community of people who are trying to solve the case on their own. Welcome to the Cooper Vortex. In this episode, we are lucky to be joined by a newcomer to the D.B. Cooper case, but he has a lot to offer. Robert Fuller is a criminal profiler and armchair sleuth from the Great White North. Robert put together a fascinating profile on D.B. Cooper and has landed on a suspect that is also quite fascinating. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Robert Fuller. Robert, when was the first time you heard about D.B. Cooper? I'm pretty sure I've heard his heard about it like over the years but I'm up here in Canada so really didn't mean too much like I've heard the name so I mean if somebody said the name D.B. Cooper I might have said sounds familiar but really wouldn't have known too much about it until I did this year it wasn't until this year that you started to really heavily get into it yeah 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 this year just happened to be watching uh tv there just flipping channels around and uh happened to see uh this guy sitting in a trailer in the woods and I don't know, he just, it just caught my eye. So I listened to him for a bit and it was a show on DB Cooper. And uh, the guy turned out to be none other than the mayor of uh, Cooperville, Bruce Smith. (laughs) So I don't know, he just caught my eye and I thought uh, maybe I might be able to help him or do something. So I got in contact. that was the HBO documentary. Probably. Like I said, I never really got too much into the show. I kept flipping around. Um, yeah, but it was back in April or just before April. And what what made you think I want to help this guy out? I don't know. There was just just something about him, just something that grabbed me. Kind of. I got. I'm working. I've been working on a case up here for 25 years, and uh, with a with a gentleman and uh, an older gentleman, and he just reminded me very much of him. And I know how passionate this guy is up here, and uh, he just just something about him. I didn't know, I didn't know who he was on the TV. I didn't know. um, I I didn't know Bruce Smith. I didn't know he wrote a book or anything like that. And what makes you qualified to help and how can you help? Well, I I can't say I'm qualified. Just uh, (laughs) it's what I like to do. I guess you can call it amateur armchair uh, sleuthing or an amateur profiling kind of thing. I've always been interested in it. So kind of been doing it for the last 25 years in my spare time in that. So uh, just the way I feel about myself and what I do, I just thought, you know, give it a shot. And if I can, I can, if I, if I can't, I can't. And so what was your intent in helping Bruce to put together sort of a a criminal profile or a suspect profile? Yeah, because I didn't know anything about the case. I didn't know uh, any of the players or anything. So I just thought that way you could do like a cold profile, right? You don't have anything, uh, any other information uh, interrupting it. And so that's where I just started. I thought uh, maybe I could do that for him and just see where it goes. And how did you start that process? Contacted him. I just looked up Bruce and uh, got an email for him and contacted him by email and just offered uh, just what I just told you, just thought I could uh, help with a profile and just see where it went. I, I, just explained a little bit about myself and uh, he seemed right up for it. Anything to, anything to try and further it. So, so how uh, do you start that profile? Uh, just basically with I did some information about uh, more of the information about, I did ask Bruce some questions and then just, I did hear it read about the Cooper's actions on the plane is basically what I was interested in. Um, his interactions with the people and uh, his demeanor and everything. And so I just had that basic information and went from there. Is there anywhere someone can see that profile you put together? Uh, Yeah. Well, uh, Bruce asked me to post it on the. The Mountain News. 
No, no, the uh, the one site there was it the, the DB Cooper forum. Yeah, and okay. then um, I think uh, so. I posted it there because somebody was asking for a profile, and it just happened to be around the same time I did it. So I posted it there, and then I think it was Nikki there that uh, he saw it and and uh, cut and pasted it over to uh, Eric's site. The DB Cooper mystery group on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's in both those places. And what does your profile tell you? What kind of type of guy do you believe this is? The one of the first things that came to me was I I said, like, uh, at one point in his life, he most likely attended or seriously thought about attending a seminary training school. So, I mean, this might sound far out to people and sometimes to me, some of the stuff does, but it was just like, just from the way uh, the stewardess talked about him and that it just almost like there was a, he was uh, with a covenant kind of thing on how he, his demeanor was. And it wasn't like he was freaking out. He just seemed polite most of the time. And it was almost, to me, it was almost like he, he couldn't go too far. Um, he just wasn't capable of that. I'm getting too out of hand uh, with, with the, with the people too impolite, you know, like freaking them out. It was just almost like that's the way he was brought up. Like a really strong moral foundation. Yeah. 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 Stronger than most. Like it was just something he couldn't have. So he's just a guy. I think he's uh, like, he has his, his training and everything. He has his skill sets, obviously. He just, some of the things he did, I thought he, he would, he, he's a type of guy. Like, so when I do a profile like this, there's, people around him that would uh, would notice certain things um, when you say so I thought he would be uh, he, he's a type of guy that would covet personal inanimate objects a man of my own heart <laughs> yeah he like he's the type he, he tends to show more affection to his personal possessions than to the human beings around him not so much like in a cold like manner it's just just who he is it's his personality um he's nice and likable but he can also be easily forgettable just almost like i guess i could say almost like a man in black kind of uh type deal he can be there and he can catch your attention but a few days later you don't even remember can't remember too much about him he just has that ability to do that um i thought that because he chose uh, the uh, the weapon he chose he knew it would elicit the greatest fear and get him the least resistance. So I, I just took that as the bomb is his voice, which to me kind of meant he, he had uh, issues standing up and speaking up for himself when he was growing up. And, and because of that, he's all, he also learned how to compromise when he was faced with confrontations because I, because Cooper there, he seemed to compromise when faced, you know, at a, at certain points, right? Like with taking off the, when he wanted to take off uh, the plane with the stairs down and uh, they said no, because they didn't think you could, he could have just said, do it or I'm going to blow the plane up. Yeah, and that's just, a good point. You know, he could just say, because if he knew they could do it, he could have just forced the hand, but he didn't. He chose to compromise and, and go that way without creating that wall kind of thing. I think he has, he has a void within himself where he feels unremarkable and he's, he tries to do remarkable things in his life to fill that void. So just like how over the top hijacking a plane and jumping out, people will, would know, would know him in life as doing little extra remark, like trying to be this remarkable person kind of thing, doing remarkable things. He feels a void. And yeah. he fills that by doing remarkable things because he doesn't feel remarkable. Yes. That's so interesting. That's just the, the everything I'm getting from him on the plane. Like, I mean, the things he's a, like a creative thinker, visualizer, meticulous planner. Obviously, I, I just a tactical training. I don't I, th- I think he's got no fear of death, but it doesn't mean he had a death wish. It just means, right. you know, whether, whether that was his military training or everything with him growing up, he just, he just didn't have a fear like for jumping out of the plane at that 
time of night in the in the weather. I don't think it bothered him. I think he had uh, his goal in mind, and that was it. And there wasn't anything going to stop him. And whether he whether he made it or didn't, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it, I don't think he didn't think he wasn't going to make it. But it just I don't think he was phased by it, even the thought of it. He's a. I thought I think he's an attention seeker. The resulting at attention is self-satisfying enough for him, even if he isn't personally acknowledged. So it's like just knowing there's people talking about it and knowing that he's the one they're talking about. He doesn't have to be the one to say, you know what, look, it's me. I'm I'm the guy. Look at me. Woohoo. I'm over here. Just listening to him, them is that that's what would give him the satisfaction. He didn't need, doesn't need to go that extra step just that type of person. He would have an interest in law enforcement and wanted to be in a job post hijacking that brought him close to law enforcement, not necessarily being an actual law enforcement officer, but I just figured he'd want to be, it seemed to know he knew stuff about law enforcement. So he had an interest in it. Like when he wanted to, the, the, the shades pulled down, uh, he just, he just seemed to have an interest in it. So I just figured that's where he'd want to be. He doesn't have to be an actual law enforcement officer, but he would love to be in the in a type of thing where he can keep an ear on things, especially if they're talking about it. Obviously, parachuting experience both day and night times and in inclement weather. <clears throat> I think he would have welcomed the bad weather. He had some or extensive survivalist training and familiar with the jump area. And obviously, I didn't know much about the, the comic book, but I mean, if, if the comic book was connected to him, he would have spent um, some time in that area, obviously, so he would be uh, uh, familiar with it. Uh, and so I wasn't sure at that time if the, the, the comic book was in an actual relation to him, but he would have had to have been there. Everything about Cooper, to me, pointed to the aspect that the bomb was either a complete fake or was never in danger of being activated. I, I just, I didn't feel he ever had any intentions of harming anybody. And I don't think he actually could harm like innocent people. I just think it was, uh, he just knew what the, the bomb would do um, and would uh, make everybody complicit. But I, I don't think it was, I don't think it was ever gonna go off. Like, I mean, if it was really dynamite, I don't think he'd want to be jumping out of the plane with it attached to him, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I um, definitely agree with you there. Like, just, it just doesn't make sense. I just, I think uh, he was either single at the time of the hijacking, most likely separated or divorced, or at least a job that could take him away from family, family if needed, or it was a combination of both. But he had uh, he had the ability to do what he did and give himself a couple of days without anybody needing him or expecting him, like family uh, or work. He just he was able to have a, a day or two to get himself on the ground and back to wherever he was going without being noticed. I think I think this whole thing began as a fantasy, just a simple fantasy. Probably never thought it would ever become reality. And uh, I think he fantasized in stages. So he would have probably doodled stuff on paper, maybe in his own covert language. And I, I just don't see him throwing anything like that out. I don't think the money was his primary focus in his fantasy. I think it was initially all about the plane and the jump. For some reason, he was just fascinated by the plane, uh, the stairs, and the whole idea of this, this jump. And uh, then the money finally, I mean, the money just got into it near the end. And uh, obviously, a, like a stressor point in his life caused it to go from fantasy to reality. Whether that, like separation or, you know, recent separation, divorce or job loss, something like that. And that's about what I did. That's what I sent to uh, Bruce and what was posted online. It's interesting that you say he fantasized about this. For a long time, because that goes with sort of how how this seems to be so well planned and executed. So if Mm -hmm. it was something that is an idea he had, maybe he knew that that plane could be jumped for one reason or another. 
and then puts this fantasy together of I could do this. It would be so cool. Like James Bond. Exactly. Yeah. But then, like you say, he has some event in his life where he's just like, F it. I'm going to, I'm going to pull that hijacking off. Exactly. Yeah. I like that, Robert. That is pretty good. Like when you said James Bond there, right? Apparently what he said to the, when he gave his name at the ticket counter, right? He said, uh, Cooper, Dan Cooper. Right. You know, which is like James Bond and also Dan Cooper himself. You know, of course, I have to talk to you about the comic book thing. As a Canadian, are you familiar with Dan Cooper, the comic? Not at all. Never heard of it. Oh, dang. (laughs) No. I, I don't know, like I, I read about it, as far as I know, it was from overseas. Like, I don't know if it really was up here in Canada. I saw a documentary on the Dan Cooper comic that was done for the CBC, I think it is. Yeah. And there, it was, it was published in French in Canada. Was it in Canada? I thought it was like overseas, like in France and... It was also published over there, but the circulation in Canada was only in French. Oh, okay. So was it circulated back at the, that time in 71? Yeah, predating the skyjacking. Oh. Okay. I didn't know that. No, I did I don't think he's Canadian. I don't think it uh, I don't think he's Canadian at all. How come you don't think DB Cooper is Canadian? Just everything. He like wasn't said, polite only... enough. <laughs> he didn't use the word A. no i like when i started this and once i get into something i usually do a pretty good deep dive so i get as much information as possible i just don't see anything about it being canadian i think he was pretty much from that area around there like not a specific city but you know portland seattle in that utah like somewhere in that area i i don't think he was coming from Canada to do that doesn't make any sense to me. What about uh, he, like Vancouver or Victoria? He could just cross the border and then he's not that far from home. And then by just slipping through the border, which back then I'm sure it was nothing because I crossed that border 15, 20 years ago and it, and it was nothing. It was like, all right, welcome oh, to Canada. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure it was. I just, I don't see anything Canadian in there. Just that's just personal opinion. I just, I just don't see it. I don't see why he would jump, go to like, go up to Seattle and then want to come back South uh, to jump. If he was up in Canada, I don't, uh, I know it's not too far, but just, uh, it might've been, but I just, for me, it doesn't ring. I don't see it. All right. So you put this profile together and then obviously you can't just stop there and close the book on DB Cooper. Where do you go from there? Well, what happened was after I did, I have a, a young friend. He's in his thirties now and uh, met him a few years ago at where we worked. I, uh, we got talking and found out he was really into this profiling stuff too, just like me. So yeah, he's one of the first guys I've actually met uh, live that actually was really into it. So uh, we would actually pick cases kind of, you know, and try to do it ourselves and, see what we come up with so uh he's the one after i i i did it before i sent it to bruce bruce i sent it to him and i told him that i was doing it for bruce and he was he thought that was pretty cool and he said let me read it because actually i guess this is one of the cases that that he was had been very interested in the past so he kind of knew who db cooper was and uh, he had looked into it before um and he's and he said well he wanted to read my profile. I was, I, I let him read it first anyway. And he said he, had, when he was looking into it, he had brought, he had come down to two suspects he liked. And so, but he, he wouldn't tell me. And I don't, we don't do that. Like this, I just got to do the profile and then we go from there. And uh, when I sent it to him, he just kind of, I just texted it, right? I sent it and he just te- texted back like, holy crap. He said he had two suspects and he said one of the suspects, he said he went on to become a, a Catholic priest because um, I put down the seminary training. I said, you're kidding. You're just joking with me, right? He said, no. So he sent me a picture of him along beside the composite, looked exactly like him. 
it turns out to be Wolfgang Gossett. And I said, holy crap, never heard the guy's name before. I didn't know who he was. And so that's at the point I said, all right, time for me to take a look at this guy and uh, try to do a little bit of a deep dive into him to see who he is if he fits more of the profile and uh, and that's where I went after and then I sent it to Bruce and then things just kind of continued but that's on my end that's what really got me interested in in delving into to Gossett and when I started on Gossett I didn't know how good a suspect he was how big he was but what I do is I tried if because he matched my profile so good everything I looked into I tried to eliminate him I wasn't looking into him to prove he did it. I looked into him trying to find anything that could eliminate him. And it's been about four months now and haven't been able to do that despite everybody else's opinion of him. I just, I can't find anything reasonable to I'm actually starting to find a couple things more uh, about him that kind of connect to the, the hijacking. I'm really looking for anybody. I've posted, I've asked anybody, if anybody can eliminate him, tell me. I've even tried to get hold of Galen because I want, if he has something, just I'm a reasonable guy. It won't take much for me to eliminate somebody, but, I, but it's got to be logical, you know, reasonable. I'd love to talk to Galen Cook. I, I've reached out to him and the only thing I've heard back is that he's not really doing this right now and doesn't want to talk about what he has until his book comes out, which is supposed to yeah. have come out every year for the last 10 years. Yeah. But let me ask you this, Robert, there isn't a lot of information on Wolfgang. So where, when you start looking into Wolfgang, where do you go? What in resources of information is there? Just online. I mean, whatever articles are online. I mean, Galen had a couple articles and Bruce had some, and I did get in contact with his son, Greg, because I listened to um, like my buddy, Sean there, Sean Menzies, he's the guy I uh, sent the, where Gossett was one of his top suspects there. And uh, so he had said that he had listened to your show with uh, um, Greg on it, uh, Gossett's son. And so, so I listened to it and then I, uh, I did get in contact with him and explained about myself and asked if he'd look at the profile and uh, he did he said yeah no problem and uh, so i sent it to him and then he was actually pretty good because he went over each point and saying you know yes yes i think that's my dad yes yes you know a couple were no so it turned out to be about 90 percent uh dead on with his dad he thought on everything what were the I things just, he disagreed with one of the things was uh Oh yeah, I, said, I forgot this paragraph here. I don't think I mentioned it because I said um, after the seminary school training, I said he has a strong attachment to his father or father-like figure, despite having attachment issues to others close to him. <clears throat> That's He didn't actually disagree with that. He just wasn't sure because he really didn't know much about his dad and his grandfather's relationship. So he really couldn't answer to, answer to that. So something like that, after I, I realized, you know, somebody like Wolfgang went on to become a Catholic priest. I mean, to me, the father-like figure could be God. And that could have been, you know, his covenant with the way he acts. When I said he had issues standing up, speaking up for himself, he, he wasn't sure about that. He didn't think so because he thought his dad was so outgoing, like had no problem telling people what's on his mind kind of thing. But but that doesn't mean he didn't grow up uh, with those issues. So he really couldn't speak to that either. When I said he's nice and likable, but also easily forgettable, he didn't think he's, he said, if you knew my dad, he wasn't an easily forgettable person. <laughs> That's true. He doesn't and, seem easily forgettable. No, but I mean that to me, that could be, if you knew him, like once you know somebody, you might not be forgettable, but somebody else that's uh, you meet for a day or two, you might forget them in, in a couple of days kind of thing. And that was about it. So it was mostly, I, like I said, it was about 90%. There's a couple he just wasn't sure about. But When I did that interview with Greg, I left and um, 
my family, we, we stayed at a little Airbnb in Utah because I drove down there to do that interview. Yeah. And I, I left his place and came back to the Airbnb and I was just convinced like it's Wolfgang Gossett. And I'm, I'm a pretty gullible guy. And I just sat across <laughs> from Greg for a few hours and hung out with him. But I, I really did leave there with like, holy hell, it's Wolfgang. It's, I can't disprove it. And, you know, like you've said, can someone point me to something that rules him out? Mm-hmm. And that's an interesting way to phrase that because there are actually a couple of suspects we can't rule out. It's it's not if a suspect can be ruled out as can you prove he's D.B. Cooper, um, because there are a couple of suspects that, you know, I just don't have enough information to rule right. them out. But Wolfgang is one when when I'm asked who I think D.B. Cooper is, you know, he's definitely he's probably in my top two. Yeah, I, I just don't understand why everybody. I think maybe because. Uh... You get a good suspect and you can only take them so far. And when there's no smoking gun, it's like, well, you know, where do we go from here? And then I guess people just kind of move on, find whatever excuse to move on to somebody else. Like someone was posted there. Someone posted on Eric's site there, listed the people and, and, and a little thing beside them where, why he thought none of the, uh, the known suspects were Cooper. So he eliminated them. And beside Gossett, he said, too full of BS. That was, that's how he eliminates Gossett. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, give me something. Like, like, even the FBI can't eliminate him. You know, they say he's eliminated, but no. I mean, I wrote down some stuff. Yeah, tell us what you learned researching Gossett. Well, oh, well, I can go, I can go with, you want to go with the Dan Cooper names and that? Yeah, let's do it. Well, I mean, the two things I think I've I've found out that other that nobody has. I know the one for sure <clears throat> um, was the name Dan Cooper, and I, I sent it to you there, so you you would know what I'd be talking about. And because uh, I remember one of the first things I asked Bruce, I remember I said, "Does any suspect or what suspect in this thing has a brother named Dan?" Even if it was with the comic book. Um, these kind of guys, it's still going to mean something to them. They don't just pick a name. I mean, it could be the comic book guy, but my first thing after all the things I've done was, does anybody have a brother named Dan? And he wasn't sure. He didn't say yes or no. So as I looked into the gossip online, like through grave sites and all that stuff where they have information on them, I see the name Dan. That's his, that's his youngest brother. And I go, okay. And so then I was eventually, it was, it was, it was a process, but then eventually I found the picture of, of his family. It's got his, his mother, father, his uh, two sisters and two brothers. And I still right then didn't click in because I'm just looking for information on him, seeing who he was, his family. Um, and then one day I was just playing around and because of the, the brother, the father and the brother's names both are Orient. They both start with O. So I thought, okay, Dan's his brother. And I was like, because first thing you do is try to look, well, does the name Cooper mean anything to him, to gossip? And I couldn't see anywhere that I was researching that it meant anything because I had a, I had a thing with this with another case back in 2002 that I, it's like the psychology of the, of the person, whether it's, whether it's, uh, consciously or subconsciously they do things and so when i was looking at the name i seen orion orion for the o's and cooper and i go holy crap and so i just thought okay let's just see where this goes and then the p was pratt which is uh his dad's middle name and his own middle name it'd be william william pratt gossett and orion pratt and then the, the e was Elizabeth, which is his sister, um, younger sister. And then when I went to the R, well, there's uh, his middle brother, his one other brother's uh, middle name, which is Roy. It's Ori and Roy. 
okay. Okay, let's, but the C I couldn't, the C was, uh, wasn't anywhere. That's like when I'm clicking on, you know, you click on their names to see who they're married to and this, I realized is the sister Nancy, who isn't actually in Dan Cooper, her husband's name, middle name was Cecil. So I thought, okay, so he hits all the letters in that one picture. I thought, I mean, a lot of people don't think that's anything, but the stuff that I've done, the stuff I've learned, combined with everything about Wolfgang, you know, he confessed, he looks like him, and he's a dead ringer for the composite, and the whole combination of it, I, th I thought, yeah, that's something. Yeah, not I mean, everyone combination. can explain an origin for the name Dan Cooper. No, but I mean, it could be because he was, he was stationed in France, I believe. I think it was France. But I think he was stationed somewhere where the, the comic book was available. So he could have been exposed to that. I mean, that could have been the precursor when he's in his fantasy stage, you know, and, you know, he needs a name. So that's it. But then, <clears throat> you know, he's doodling around because he realizes Dan's his brother's name and says, well, I wonder what else is here. And then he, you know, and then he probably goes through the process I did, because once you get the two O's there, the rest of it just falls into place. And, you know, someone like, someone like Gossett, from what I've learned, <clears throat> I mean, he would have just thought that was something otherly worldly, like some other sign from above to connect, to say, hey, this is meant to be, this is something I got to do. What do you think of the fact that Gossett chose to confess to two different lawyers and his sons on, I can't remember if it was their 18th or 21st birthdays. 21st. I think it's, I think it's very strong. I think it's exactly <clears throat> like there's people that say, well, now there's the thing that goes, people say, well, anybody that confessed is not a suspect. You just rule them out, which doesn't make any sense. I would fully expect cooper to tell somebody well people are saying that because we have hundreds of confessions well that's just natural in a case like this but i mean if you really look at it someone that what cooper did providing he survived i find it i would find it almost impossible that he wouldn't want to tell someone it doesn't mean he wants to like shout it out to the to the world and get caught but he went, to, he went to two lawyers i believe one of them was a retired judge i could be wrong but i read that so what what He's going to two lawyers, so he knows it's either going to be confidential or does he want them to bring it forward? I don't know, but it's not like he's going to a party to tell somebody or he's just telling friends, you know, like I, I'm D.B. Cooper or anything, and then that they, they can spread the room around. He's actually going to people where he knows, well, they're either going to give me good advice and it's going to be kept quiet or they're going to tell me I need to do something kind of thing. So I think it's, I think it's, I really like it that he did that. Plus his sons, I mean, I, I'm still trying to figure out why he waited till their 21st birthday, because that makes him legal age in the States. So I think there's something to that, that he would wait till they're 20. He didn't just tell them at 18 or, or whatever, right? He, waited, he wanted to wait till they're 21. And then he asked them not to tell anybody. And from what I understand, from what I get from his type of personality, when he said something, you don't go, you wouldn't go against them. Like if he told you, you don't tell anybody, the kids aren't going to tell anybody. So he wants to, you know, maybe he's trying, I'm not sure when he told the lawyers, but maybe he needed to tell somebody before he went on to become a Catholic priest. I don't know. I believe the confession to the lawyers was towards the end of his life. Was it? Yeah. I, I like, I think, I think it's strong. I mean, most people don't, most people don't want, uh, think he, Cooper wouldn't confess because he hasn't been caught. I, I can't, I can't see Cooper not telling somebody. And I think the way Wolfgang did it was exactly how he could keep it quiet and still let somebody know. I agree. I think Cooper had to have told someone. Oh yeah. It's too amazing to not tell someone. And, yeah. and certainly you don't want to go running your mouth about it. Um, a few years after the skyjacking, uh, no. Sort of like Rackstraw did. But yeah. I mean, the way Wolfgang did confess, I find very interesting. What do you think of the safety deposit box 
in Vancouver, BC. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, not just the box, but the way he did it is exactly what was in my profile. Uh, how he, that whatever was in the bag, that was his whole thing. And he used his son, you know, you know, tell his son, we're going to go this, we're going to, we're going to do whatever fishing, camping for a week or whatever. So he, it's like this father son thing, but his whole purpose in his mind was this possession he had in the bag. And that's exactly how, I mean, that's exact fit for my, my profile where he covets his possessions over, you know, the human beings in his life. I think, I'm not sure what was in the bag. I don't know if it was the money, but that whole process fits at least a gossip. Oh yeah. And, and I heard somebody argue with me about this, that it, they're, um, that gossip would have had to have had a passport. And so there would no. have been evidence of that trip. And that's no, so no. totally false. Uh, I believe you do have to have a passport now, but oh, yeah. when I was doing it in like 2003, 2005, 2008, um, we just drove from Washington into Vancouver and we didn't need anything except our driver's license. Yeah, exactly. There was, I mean, when I, occasionally yeah. we got my car searched cause it was just like punk kids coming through there. Yeah. But, um, we didn't need any documents or anything. They wanted the business and the tourism. There was no oh, passport needed. Exactly. And that's why he took his son because he wouldn't get asked any questions, right? He's just with his son on a fishing trip or whatever. It's not like he looks suspicious, but yeah. I mean, when I went well, nine, well, 2001, we went to Disney world. We didn't need, need much. I mean, and I remember crossing the border as a kid with my family. They, they just looked at you. If you looked okay, see you later. So like in 71, no, you didn't need anything. Yeah. They might ask you for a driver's license. That's it. There's no passport in 1971. No, definitely not. Yeah. Like that's why he had his kid, right? So he he used his kid. And I don't think Gossett would even understand how much that would hurt his kid. Like that's just that's just that's the same thing I, I had with Cooper there, just uh where he covets his personal possessions over, you know, the human beings around him, but he doesn't really understand what it does to them. So when when Gossett did this with his son, took him to up to Vancouver and that. And promise him this and this went out for two hours came around and said we're going home he just there wouldn't it wouldn't register for him exactly what he was doing to his son it just not that he was doing it on purpose or he was trying to be mean he wouldn't know how much he hurt his kid yeah it, it, it's when greg told me how his dad confessed to him on his birthday and it's like he pulled him away from the party yeah took him down into the basement told him this story and like, I'm blown away by it, obviously, because I'm so into this. Yeah. But Greg was like, my reaction, my reaction was, are you done talking now? Can I go back to the party? <laughs> <laughs> like, th that's the interaction I've been waiting for my entire life for yeah. for D.B. Cooper to confess and tell me the whole story. <laughs> uh, and meanwhile, Greg is just waiting for him to stop talking. I, I absolutely love that. Yeah. But the other thing about that. Um that really caught my eye too. And it doesn't seem to catch people's eye is when he described like his dad opened a locked filing cabinet or cabinet, wherever the file was, he brought out a file. Um, first of all, it was locked. And then he brought out this big file that had uh, newspaper clippings and things about the hijacking. I, I would expect Cooper to do that too. Exactly. So, I mean, that's just a classic, classic, uh, classic thing to do he'd want to keep an eye on it and that's what you know would give him the fuel you know to fill that void in him when he needs to he just goes down and you know it's kind of like that uh, serial killer btk you know he disappeared for years but what he had was he had a locked garage and he had mementos out there driver's license of the victims so he could go out there and do the same thing and relive it and that would satisfying him so that's kind of exactly what i would i mean gossip that's what i think gossip did but that's what i think cooper would do too oh i, mean, I, I agree a hundred percent um because you know myself if i pull off the next most daring heist i'm definitely saving articles about it although it's yeah, tough to clip things out of the internet but um <laughs> yeah definitely. i don't I, I haven't heard any other uh suspects doing that like, 
I haven't really done a deep dive into really any other suspects because I'm trying to get past Gossett, but I do keep an eye on them. And I, I haven't heard any other suspect acting like that. And I'm sure like if an FBI profiler would say, you know, that's what they would expect or wouldn't, it wouldn't be unexpected for uh, Cooper to do that, especially when he doesn't seem to do any more crimes kind of thing. This is kind of like a one-off thing. So why do you think there aren't many people who are proponents of gossip? Well, when I, there are, they do come out because they do say, yeah, gossip, uh, you know, but then other people jump in and then that, so I think there's, I think there's enough of them out there, but it's like I said, there just isn't the smoking gun. They just, you know, there's not, there's nothing to do. Can't find the money, the notes. Like he took, like Cooper took back the notes, right. And the, the match, the match uh, cover. Oh yeah. Do the match cover here in a minute. Um, but the way he took them back to me without knowing too much when I, it's just, they were more like his personal possessions. Like they, to him, they were personal. So if he made it to the ground with them, he's going to keep them somewhere. He's not throwing them out. He's not throwing the notes out. I mean, he only, only one note was actually his, if I'm correct, the first one. And then he dictated the rest, correct? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but still <clears throat> they're like his dictation. So some people look at stuff he took back because of uh, fingerprints or he's aware of this and that. Well, I don't think so because he left the glass <clears throat> and he left the cigarette butts and to him, to Cooper. They're, they're not his like cigarette butts are just, they're garbage now. Um, and the glass doesn't mean anything to him, but I think the, uh, the, <clears throat> the notes to me are personal. That's why the tie it really gets me because I can tell you from well, at least my, I mean, this is just my profile of him. If that was his personal tie that he wore every day, He's not leaving it behind. I don't think he'd be capable of leaving it behind. I think he'd make sure he had that on him before he had the money. I just don't see him, even by accident, I don't see him. Now, I'm not saying that's not the tie he he wore, he didn't. I mean, I'm not saying that's not the tie he wore, because it probably was. What I'm saying is, I just don't believe that's his personal tie. Whether he got it from somebody or somewhere else, <clears throat> you know, dad cousin or wherever i just don't think it had any personal meeting to cooper or it's possible he didn't mean to leave it behind i've thought about this before he was so careful to take everything with him yeah i think he knew he didn't want to jump with the tie and intended to take it with him but when he took it off he set it on the seat or threw it somewhere so well, he could have possible he also wanted to take the tie but overlooked that well he could have I mean, just according to what I, what I th think of him, I don't think he'd be capable of doing that. Like, I I'd think it's just ingrained in him. Like when he, his actions to take the cover, the, the matchbook cover thing back from uh, Tina, when he thought she was going to throw it out, it was like, I read, he, it was like, he kind of snatched it back. Like, you're not throwing that out. I don't think he'd be capable I think the tie, <clears throat> if it was his personal tie he wore every day and it meant something to him, he'd rather leave the money behind than the tie. Not that he would, but I just think it was that it would be that important. He just wouldn't be capable. I don't think he'd be capable of, uh, in his personality, of leaving that, accidentally leaving the tie behind. I think he would have just put shoved it in his pocket or... The, the tie really is <laughs> the, the primary piece of evidence. What do you think of the metal, metal particles found on the tie? Do you think that's how this case gets solved? Personally, no. I mean, it could. I mean, it's what they're doing on it is great. Like, they I mean, the, the research skills are, are crazy good. But, <clears throat> I mean, you're talking, what, three particles out of 100,000 or so? I mean, we don't know how they got on there. I know there's <clears throat> study of, of where it came from, and it can only have come from there. But I mean, there's there's transference issues. I mean, it'll be it'll be good to see how it um, that investigation turns out. But I don't know. You got three particles out of a hundred thousand. You think there would be more on it if he was a person from that that business? Like I, I don't know the the ratio in that, but 
just seems like there should have been more on there. <clears throat> Plus, the tie is uh, was eight years old. <clears throat> I learned this some of this stuff today. The tie was eight years old, and these particles, the the three special particles they're talking about, had to have been on the tie by 1965, because after that they weren't using this material. So that means those particles were on the tie for at least six years. I don't know. The, this, if somebody is wearing a tie every day with a suit and tie to work, do they not wash their tie? Or how does how do particles stay on a tie for that long without, you know, and how long do people keep those clip-on ties? Like years? There's there's lots of questions. I'd have way more questions than, but I think it's I think it's good what they're doing to see where it goes. But then the theory becomes this place is out in Pittsburgh, I guess. And I, I don't see a guy in Pittsburgh. And I, I've heard the, I've read the theory on the whole thing, you know, how it combines with Tina Barr. I just, it's just, it's just way out there for me. I mean, I think that I think way out there, but this, <clears throat> for me to, to, to think that somebody from, is going to go to from Pittsburgh, travel all the way to Portland, just to hijack a plane to Seattle and then jump coming back. And what's the theory? He jumps coming back. He jumped later than he expected, which I agree with. I thought he was, I think he wanted to jump sooner than he did, but then he jumps. And then when he lands, he lands near Tina bar. And uh, then he decides to bury the money, all of it in the, in the sand. And then he makes his way back to Pittsburgh. I don't see anybody doing, I just don't see anybody burying it. First of all, it's the middle of the night. If he's not from the area, he really does. How does he know what sandbar he buried it in? It's raining. It's dark. And if you're going to bury the money, why would you travel back across the States and leave it on the other side of the States? Like I just, to me, that doesn't make sense. And then apparently <clears throat> when the floods happened, he came back to dig it up before the floods took it away. And that's how the three packets got left. I, I just, it's a little too far fetched for me. Like, first of all, how he knows, how, how long's it taken when he hears about the floods? I mean, this is 1971, they don't have the internet. So I don't know if he's keeping an eye on Portland area or Seattle, he hears about the floods. Well, he's still got to get on a plane, travel all the way back, then dig up the money because of the floods. Well, how long was he going to leave the money there for? And I, I can't see me hijacking a plane, burying the money and going across Canada and leaving it there. I, I, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, and it's buried in a sandbar where when Brian found the money, he came down with his parents. It didn't take him long to find the money. So how no, it was is, just under the surface too. It wasn't buried. No, not too. Yeah. So how are, you know, I can't see people, someone not finding it, you know, digging around, horsing around. It's uh it seems like a, a far-fetched way to, it's one of those things where I think somebody thinks they have a suspect, may have a good suspect. So now we got to fit the evidence to the suspect. And that I happens mean, I a lot. Yeah. And this is where, where some cases I dealt with, especially one I've been on, like I said, for 25 years, it's got to do with a missing girl and, and, her, <clears throat> and her boyfriend who ended up being wrongly convicted. And when you get that mindset, that's how people get wrongly convicted. That's how the innocent go to the thing, because you make things fit, you make things fit. And when they're, when it just doesn't seem logical. I mean, I'm not a scientist or anything, but sometimes it's just kind of, you know, layman term logic that doesn't make sense. Why would someone would bury it, go all the way back to Pittsburgh and then just sit there and wait for a flood or something. You mentioned the matchbook. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The matchbook. <clears throat> so that, that's where my mind goes because I think, well, I want to know about this Matt because he snatched it back. So there's something meaning on him, to him. Um, so I, I asked uh, on Eric's site, and then uh, it was actually Nikki B who said that he had checked it out, investigated it, and it was the ICS, which is the uh, international, uh, the, the <clears throat> training courses that go through the mail. And he sent me a picture of it. And uh, so then I asked Greg, I just, uh, Wolfgang's son, I just asked him a question without mentioning the matchbook. It, just ask, you know, do you, do you ever know of your dad to take any courses through the mail? And I didn't even think he did. I was just a question I want to ask. And he wrote back, 
And, and he, and Greg doesn't always get back. Like he's not a type of guy that is out there going rue raw, like let's do books or that. Like, I mean, he doesn't always get back. Cause I'm, so he, I think this guy is so credible. Greg is just, yeah. DB Cooper is like his 27th priority. He yeah, does, ex- he that's ex- exactly right. And so, but with this one, he did get back and he says, yeah, he says, I'm pretty sure my dad did the, uh, the Catholic priest training through, uh, the mail, the mail order training. Well, you know, if, if you do that, one would think he's had experience through mail order training and with, with the types of jobs, that, the different jobs that Gossett had, I mean, it's not a, it's not a stretch to think back in 1971, <clears throat> he, he had, uh, or before he had done some of that and got a hold of a matchbook like that. And, uh, and he was a teacher too, so he could get it through that way. And that like the, the saying on the back of it was, uh, how to earn an ICS high school diploma. Well, um, Bill was co-pilot Ratchacek. Is that his name? Bill? Yeah, uh, Rat- Ratizak, Rat- Call him the rat. Rat. Yeah. Okay, call him the rat. Anyways, <clears throat> there was questions on the site. That wasn't the one of the matchbooks because the other one was Sky Chef, but the uh, Nikki B got the uh the video of Bill where he's uh doing a, a discussion where he's telling his whole story and he actually says in it that uh talking about the matchbook and then he says when they're in the debriefing he asked because he wanted to know what was on the matchbook somebody said there was something on the matchbook and he was told in the debriefing that it said something like how to get a how to get your high school diploma and so i think nikki b ran with that and investigated it backwards and came up with, you know, those mat- matches from ICS, which say how to earn uh, ICS uh, high school diploma, which, you know, when you're on a flight, you're going to, what you're going to see is the high school diploma. Your mind's not really going to take in every word on the matchbook. So Nikki's uh, pretty great at finding that obscure stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I think that's a easy thing. So he, he took that back because it was Cooper took it back because it was personal to him. Uh, if it's gossip, it's personal to him. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't know, like obviously the FBI, I don't think ever figured that out, but if they had of, if they had a looked at the matchbook, they could have went to ICS back then and say, you know, or even when they, even when gossip came on the radar, they could have called uh, ICS. Maybe they have any records back then. That's interesting. Of, of gossip. Right. And then, and I've asked, I, I mean, I've asked if there's been, uh, I even asked Larry Carr there, the retired FBI guy on Eric's site, <clears throat> if the FBI had done an actual criminal profile from the profiling unit. And he says he's never seen one, which strikes me as odd because you'd think even when Larry Carr took over or whoever, you wouldn't, wouldn't uh, you know, by whatever date that was, 2009 or something, you think one of the first things they'd want to do is say, hey, give me a profile of this guy from the, you know, their professionals to say, you know, maybe we could narrow it down. And it doesn't seem like one was ever done, which, which I find odd. Yeah. It seems like from the jump, their plan was just, okay, there's not a lot of people who skydive. So we already narrowed the pool down significantly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the FBI, there's two reasons like I, that I've seen that the FBI says it, it's not gossip. They say, um, they can't place them there. They can't place them there at the hijack. Well, and that's all they said. So sometimes it's not what they say, it's what they're not saying is what I look for. If you can't place them there, then tell me where you can place them. And because they didn't say that, they can't place them anywhere else. So it doesn't mean he wasn't there, but they they can't place them anywhere to say, okay, he's got an alibi. We know he was here, here, here. Yeah, if you've got that. an alibi for Gossett, I'd love to read it. No, that's right. But they didn't say that. He, they just said, well, we can't place them there. Well, that's not good enough. If you can't place them there, what you're saying is, I can't place them anywhere else. Well, that doesn't eliminate them. That's just giving you a way to say, a reason to, for people to think you're eliminating them. The other thing they say is, uh, uh, this is what I read, that there's no, they said not one single thing linking Gossett to the hijacking. I'd like to know what their 
idea of linking someone to a crime is because you know I, I just wrote down some stuff that Cooper and and uh, Gossett had in common here. Okay, they both smoked Raleigh cigarettes. They both drank bourbon. Wolfgang, I mean Gossett, he's got his jump wings on in a picture, so he went through the training school at least for for uh, jumping. He's definitely got survival skills, especially when his son Greg says, uh, you know, he'd go out for a two hundred mile hike or whatever, you know. And I think I think uh, his dad, Wolfgang's dad, was also a survivalist. Apparently, Wolfgang was stationed overseas, which had access to the Cooper comic book. Looks exactly like the composite drawing. From what the the he's soft spoken because I watched a video on him, so his voice seems very much like the way it was described. I don't see him as like Lily White, Caucasian. I you agree. Know, the, right? He, he, you know what? Whatever Tina's definition of swarthy is, I mean, some people are saying you know, Latino or, or Native American. And I, I pose it not, it's not. And I'll tell you why, because number one, she uses the word Caucasian. The other guy, Bill Mitchell on the plane, he said, when he looked over, he said, I just noticed a white guy. A geeky old white guy. Yeah. Now, if, especially in 71, I would say that they're going to notice facial features, like from a Native American Indian and uh hispanic latino there's going to be a difference in facial features between that and a white guy there, there just is i mean bill's not going to look over he might if, if there was any question he might have said well yeah but he was i wasn't really sure but there's no question yeah he's just a white guy and he didn't really notice the swarthy skin thing so that's something tina noticed up close and what her definition of that but she's still she's right with him she says he's caucasian I'm sure she would notice um, Latino features, you know, Indian features, Native American Indian features on a per especially a middle-aged man, um, and they didn't. So uh, um, the family portrait names match with Dan Cooper, which they obviously didn't go that far. The ICS matchbook, he took mail order things. He was a military law teacher, I think, I believe, correct? He taught military law. I, something like that. Yeah, well, he did teach at Weber State, I think, and then I think he taught it in the in the in the military too. But that gives him the the ability to be executive like and well spoken. Like, I mean, you're not going to be able to teach law without, you know, because they they kind of think he's like an executive type because of the way he dressed. Well, any con man can pull himself off as an executive type, like looking. But Gossett also had the, 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 the schooling and all that to be well-spoken too, to, to be an executive. And like I said, he'd go on two mile, like his son said, he'd go on 200 mile hikes. So he's got survivalists. But if he's doing that kind of hiking and survivalist training, you would think he's going to have blue collar like hands. Like his hands aren't going to be super soft in an office all day type of thing because I think Tina mentioned something about his hands, even though he looked like an executive. I think she mentioned something about his hands um, being more like a mechanic's hands. And I think the guy at the ticket agent that he got the ticket from mentioned something about him feeling he was more like a blue collar type guy. Like, I mean, when the FBI says these things, uh, there's nothing, nothing linking Gossett to the hijacking. I tell you what, there's probably 80% or 90% more in what I wrote down than what the police had to convict the guy, the innocent guy on the case I was working on. Can you make a case against Gossett? No, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find anything uh, to make a case against him. Uh, the only thing, I don't, the only thing that's out there might be the height, but I still don't see that because. Did he have brown eyes? As far as I know, he did. I can't recall, but I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, he had brown eyes. But I can't remember I can't. off the top of my head, but yeah, cause it would have caught my eye if he had blue eyes or or something like that. But and then then people are going on about the height now, and you know, like height. I'm willing to put a pretty a pretty forgiving buffer on either end in height because I've done this myself. 
I've looked at a guy across the aisle on an airplane and thought, I'm going to guess his height. Yeah. And then when we get off the plane, I sort of make a point to walk by him. And it's, it's tough. It's not easy to guess someone's height in an airplane unless no. they're outrageously tall or outrageously short. Exactly. Yeah. If they're average height, you really, you really can't guess. No, no. And especially in a, a fleeting circumstance where you really don't, I mean, on the plane, I mean, they're with them, but if there's somebody in the, in the airport, they're not paying attention to every, every person. Right. So if it's a fleeting encounter, you just get a best guess. So I like, I I'm happy with like five, 10 to six foot or five, 10 to six, one. I mean, the other, some other guys are really pushing the six, one, uh, height because it was written in the, uh, the, the notes from the cabin crew when they took their notes down, somebody wrote six foot one. And then there was a guy from the airport worker who said, who stated, Oh yeah. Cause it's in a three Oh two somewhere that the guy he saw was six foot one. And so they said, well, they match. And from the things I've learned on how law enforcement works, you got to look at the timing of, of these things. So you have, sure. There's six foot one on the, on the, in the notes from the plane. So the FBI gets that information. And so they're putting it down in the, in their own information. So the issue with this is the guy at, who worked in the airport, he wasn't interviewed until six days later, I think it was, like on the 30th. So what? there's no reason for him to have remembered something unless he was talked to that night because they probably even, he didn't probably even know about the hijack until the next day probably. And there's nothing to say the person he saw, he would even think was Cooper. So by the time six days go by, they have their six foot one on their thing probably on their, who's ever interviewing them, they have information. And what, what law enforcement does, I'm not saying that this happened in this case, but what they do do is they try to um, push a, uh, not push hard, but like see how far a witness will go with their uh, description. So like he could ask the guy, well, how, how high, how, how tall do you think he was? The guy could have said 5'11", maybe. And so what law enforcement does, especially if they have a number down, they would say, well, 5'11", you think he could be six foot? That uh, people, all they want to do is help the police, especially if they're trying to catch a guy, a bad guy. Yeah, six foot. You're only talking one inch, right? So you think, yeah, he could be six foot. Then the agent would go, uh, how about six foot, foot one? You think, you know, six foot one? Yeah, yeah, you know, he could have been six foot one. He, did, he probably didn't say he is six. He said he could have been probably six foot one. And once you hit their magic, whatever they're looking for, that's it. They say, okay. So you, you're pretty sure he could have been six foot one. Yeah, pretty sure. All the, all witnesses try to do, they try to help, especially if they think they're really helping. And so the, you know, agent says, okay. And, but once you lock into what they want, you can't change it. A witness can't go back afterwards and say, oh, cause then they get on you and say, well, no, you said he was six foot one. And that's it. And there's lots of cases out there where people try to, and they get, you know, they get threatened by uh, uh, prosecutors and stuff. I've seen so many shows where once you say something and, and you want to go back, they threaten you with, you know, impeding investigation and stuff. Cause you hit their number. I'm not saying that's what happened in the Cooper case, but it definitely has that thing because it was six days later. So for me, even if, it was 5'10", and this guy said, yeah, he was 5'10". I might not put them both together just because it goes to my suspect. You got to look at the, the time difference between uh, uh, the things. Like to talk to a guy six days later, I can't see it being on a fleeting. It was more of a fleeting uh, encounter, right? Yeah, he probably talked to 230 people that day. Exactly. And how is he going to remember? So maybe that night he might have remembered, maybe even the next day, but six days later when they already have six foot one. I mean, how do you look across and determine if, because I think the guy was standing alone, Cooper's not with anybody. W what are you judging him to? How do you know that's six foot one? You don't have a tape measure there. So it just, it just, some people say, okay, well, there's that, that, therefore he's six foot one, which is going toward their suspect. Well, I can't do, I can't. I, I like to stick with the range like you did. 
I've done it myself. I, I've tested myself in the last couple of years and I'm so far off. I would never make a good witness. No, <laughs> not even close. All right, Robert, do you think the flight path is accurate? I don't know. I really haven't gotten into that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't gotten that far. I'd like to, but I, I'm just, like I said, I've only been on this since April. So I'm trying to understand the differences in the flight paths. The thing about the flight paths I got from Cooper is that in his mind, if you try it, like I try to get in their minds, is that let's look at what he said. He won't not the actual flight path, but I'm trying to look where he was looking to go because he was obviously going to jump. He was going to jump fairly soon because he wanted the stairs down. But in his mind, he says, okay, take off or go to Mexico. So what I want to do is draw a line from the Seattle airport to Mexico because somewhere in his mind or his planning, I think that's where he wanted to go. Like, you know, wherever that line is, he had an idea that's where he wants to jump. Now, how far off the flight path went from that, it's, it's hard to say. It doesn't seem to be any exact. I mean, there's, you ask one person, it's this way. You ask one person, it's that way, right? Like, I don't know how they get to, uh, so it, it, for me, it's I, more about him where he actually wanted the plane to go to try to figure out where he actually wanted to jump, which might bring more toward who he was kind of thing. Do you think the generally accepted drop zone of Ariel Amboy Yakult is is the correct area? Well, I haven't got that far yet either. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, want, I want to get into it. What I want to do is ask somebody, like I was asking, I think it was yesterday or day, the timing, like how long does it take the plane to get up to 10,000? And somebody said it was like 25 minutes to 30 or something. And then uh, just, I don't see how hard, not how hard, but people who jump, should know if I jump here at whatever wind and all that. So if he jumps at 8, 15 or whatever time it was, right, from takeoff, at least you know there's a starting point. Wherever it was along the east-west part, at least that's a, that's a kind of a starting point. And then you can take a range north to south, you know, how many miles it would be. And then you can just block it east and west, um, even using both flight paths. And you kind of get an area. So you get more like of an area that uh, I'd have to look at that and then try to see what he's looking at kind of thing. So I don't, I don't think he landed in water. Like I think he survived. So as I said, I'm from Canada, so I don't, I don't know <clears throat> the area there that well. So I'd have to. I don't, I don't think he landed in water either. The first thing I say to someone when they're like, well, he probably landed in water and died. What is the percentage of land to water in that area? Yeah. It, it's got to be like 99% land. Yeah. There is some water in the area, but it's not dominant. We're not talking about islands in the ocean. We're talking about the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd think if he landed in water, <clears throat> there's going to be some parachute floating somewhere. There's got to be, I can't see it. Everything just disappearing. And the, and the, the theory that the money, three, three, three things of the money fell out of the bag on the way down or in to hit the water and by themselves, they three things went down the current up to the sandbar and then got on the sandbar and buried themselves. Ah, I, I can't go for that either. <clears throat> like, I don't know how three, three packets get out without the rest of it getting out. How does the money get to Tina bar? That's, that's, that's interesting. I would say, I would say it was buried per, personally. And then I, then I know that, uh, Greg's son had that little story about his dad. Oh, from his from his stepmother or mother, that said uh, they were out fishing or something. Um, the stepmother and Gossett, and he pointed to the bar and said somebody's going to find money there or something. Um, and he said his stepmom or whoever she is, like she's a if she says something, she doesn't mess around. Then you can believe her. Well, if she in fact said that, you know. Did the, did the FBI go interview her to see if she actually said that? Like, I mean, that's pretty strong for him to say that. And then. Oh, and I believe he said something like, uh, this is a woman who did not like him anymore. So she had no reason yeah. to, to defend him in any way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think I, the way my mind works and other people have said it too, and other people slough it off is, <clears throat> I mean, what are the odds you find money at Tina bar and the person Cooper spent the most time with name was Tina. I know they're spelt different, but you know, 
I mean, there, there's people out there that do that. They just like a little ode to her kind of thing, you know, just and it, like the name could have been. Yeah. Like Tina's for Tina. So he bur buries it there. And uh, um, when it's found, it, it's so they know he's still out there. You know what I mean? What do you think of the fact that there were different versions of the sketch released? Well, I think the first was the first one, the uh, first one's the Bing Crosby. The yeah. second one's the Cary Grant. I, I seen the first one. I, I think I told Bruce right away. I said, that's not it. I said, this is before I really knew anything. Even if I didn't even know gossip. I'm pretty sure I told him, I said, that's not even a, that's not a sketch. That's not even a person. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. Just looking at it. I just, <laughs> you know, it just, and then I got seen the second one, you know, that's more like a sketch, but the first one to me, just, I, I don't think, I don't think it resembled I don't know where they got it from, or then I find out that it's not really the one the stewardess believes. So I don't know where they got it. But then I think of the, you know, the Unabomber case and where that sketch, that's all they had all along. And I think it turned out to be the guy who actually was doing the sketch or something. It wasn't actually uh, the Unabomber. It was, it was it's like, crazy. It, they're both so generic, especially with sunglasses on. Yeah. It's like that's basically. 60 percent of men so it doesn't really narrow it down yeah why do you think this case is still unsolved going on 51 years now glad you asked uh, i think it i wouldn't be shocked if the fbi knows who did it and that's why they closed the case because you, you look at uh i look at things like like gossip right they really they eliminate them but they really don't have any reasons logical reasons to eliminate them so one thing I look at with Gossett is I look, I say, well, is there anything about him that would seriously embarrass the FBI enough that they don't want anything to do with him? And the answer is obviously yes, because they, uh, they recruited him for a uh, undercover op to uh, go into that cult to rescue a girl. He rescues the girl and then they give him accommodation for it. I mean, Im imagine the, uh, the public embarrassment and the heads that would roll if they were to come out publicly and say, uh, yeah, we, we've got, we found out who Cooper was. Oh, and by the way, we, uh, we were, we, we recruited him and uh, gave him a commendation, but we didn't know who he was. I mean, that, that would just, the, the media would have a field day, the public, they would lose their, their faith in the FBI. I mean, that would be a, I don't think people realize how huge a deal that would be for the FBI. And that's something for sure in any law enforcement, they would want to quash. So I just, I don't think, I know these 302s are coming out, but I don't think they would ever give everything out they had on them. Usually there's a good chance they know who it is or they, they have a pretty good idea. They just don't want to go any further with it. I mean, as for the rest of us, we can only take things so far. I mean, law enforcement actually has to be the final say in it because they're the ones that can dig the deepest so i'm not sure if people at this point actually want it solved you know i think if, if it actually gets solved where does all the cooper stuff go like i mean it, it's such a story for everybody that uh, i think it would be a sad day if it if it gets i mean i'd love to get solved because i'm in canada i really don't, don't have a, <laughs> a, a thing in this thing but i just i don't think it makes me wonder like the retired FBI, Larry Carr there, I was watching a couple of his things, uh, YouTube or the videos with Eric. And it turns out he, like he was, uh, he was a case manager on the Cooper case. So he, he wasn't the boots to the ground person. He didn't do any of that. What I'd like to know is what boots to the ground work did you do on gossip? I mean, with the story that Greg had, like even, you know, you walk away going, holy crap. You would think they would at least really investigate this guy i don't think they did anything like i don't see any i'd love to know was there any boots to the ground people out there uh investigating him or did you just do what greg gave you and what galen gave you and just said well i don't know There's, at some point it just seems like they just i i've never seen that anybody any law enforcement shut a case down publicly like that especially one so famous Something went on. Something went on behind the doors from the guys higher up that 
they had to shut the case down. It is interesting. I, I can't think of any gossip specific 302s that I've seen. No, I, that's true either. I, yeah, you don't hear anybody talk about anything that would have his name in it. Whereas there's like stuff with McCoy. And I mean, I, you think about it, he's such a good suspect. Like, I think I'm pretty, I've been, you know, sleuthing for 20, over 25 years now. And I would think in four months, four or five months, however long I've been doing this on Gossett, I should have found something pretty easy to eliminate him. And, and there's nothing and nobody can come up with anything. So if you can't come up with anything, then, you know, something's, something's not right. Like something's just, I don't know why he wasn't like thoroughly investigated. What would it take to solve this case? What could you unearth? What could you discover? Well, obviously it's either the money, but like I've asked Greg and I never got a response, but <clears throat> I asked them, I mean, it's gotta be something physical. It's not just gonna be something online or anything, but I asked them, you know, do you have any of your dad's stuff or do you think it's anywhere or anything like, cause I think he would have been doodling stuff about the hijack, but also he would have kept stuff like the notes, you know, the matchbook. I just, there's, there would be, I think he would still have um, stuff. He kept Cooper. Let's just put it with Cooper, not just gossip. I don't think he would throw the stuff away. Like I, there's going to be, Somebody's going to be able to find uh, whether it's buried in a backyard or something, not just the money, but evidence like the notes from the hijacking, the briefcase, the briefcase. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With the stuff in it. I mean, there's another thing that Greg said that he grew up with that stuff other than the dynamite, but I don't think it was dynamite. I mean, that's the first thing my buddy Sean there said, he said, first of all, dynamite, red sticks of dynamite is what you see in the cartoons and so when you when like i mean uh, cooper obviously realized that so you put some red sticks together people are just going to think they're dynamite no I mean, one would, questions would, the authenticity of your bomb on an airplane no they wouldn't especially <laughs> when they've never seen one you know what i mean like um i would i would think you know i mean greg said he's seen a battery like that the flares so I think either finding the notes, uh, that kind of evidence, or the money, um, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to see how it's actually going to be case closed kind of thing. Do you think this will ever be solved? It could be, for sure, if they had the right... I didn't ask you if it could be, Robert. Will <laughs> this ever be solved? <laughs> Uh, give me another six months, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I think it will. I, I do. I think, I think there's enough people on it. Yeah, I, th I think it will. I, w I would hope it will, but uh, it certainly can be solved. You, I know you said you haven't delved into a lot of the other suspects, but there was just that new Netflix documentary, D.B. Cooper, Where Are You? Yeah. That, that featured Richard Rackstraw, I mean, Richard Rackstraw, Robert Rackstraw pretty heavily. What do you think of Rackstraw as a suspect? No, I don't. And I mean, despite, I think it was his age, wasn't it? And other stuff. But the one thing with Colbert and his team that I find shocking is that they, they, they got these three letters, right? That they went through and did the code they, to them, right? And it, and it was Rackstraw. Okay, let's just say it was Rackstraw that wrote those letters. Well, you're going to tell me Colbert and 40 of his scientists or whoever they are, because they attribute letters to Rackstraw, that means he's automatically Cooper. It doesn't prove anything. All it proves, all it would prove is Rackstraw wrote the letters. Anybody could write the letters. Rackstraw could have been just messing with them. I'm not saying he wrote them. I'm just saying you can't take that leap. I mean, that's just a silly leap to take is to say he wrote the letters, therefore he's Cooper. Um, among 99 other things, which they don't list any of them. I think, I think Rackstraw is just the type of guy that just played with them, you know, just his thing. Okay. Well, I'll just play along. It's not like he wanted to come forward with anything, but anytime they came, why not? He just messes with them. That's yeah. just, well, it's cool. Has some uh, cachet to it. Yeah. Yeah. So the other one was, uh, the other one was uh, McCoy. McCoy, yeah, that's the other one I was going to ask about because yeah, that... those two have really got a lot of attention lately. 
And for the vast majority of people inside the Cooper vortex, it's those two suspects you can discount right away. Yeah. And I don't, like, I mean, I discount McCoy for sure, but if you're in law enforcement, I mean, that's why they went for McCoy, I think way back. Cause it, it's so similar. I think it's actually beyond a copycat. It just, from what I've read, it just seems like there's, it's so much alike, but he didn't do it. Do you think there's a potential that Gossett knew McCoy? Well, I think there, there's a potential that Cooper knew McCoy. And then, yeah, there's a big potential Gossett. So <clears throat> we can just have fun with this because it might not be true. But so you think McCoy and Cooper at some point meet, discuss, maybe they got the same interests, whatever. And Cooper kind of says what he's going to do. And he says, well, if I do it, you'll know it's me. And so that means Cooper's got to leave him some obvious messages that it was him without them ever meeting again kind of thing, right? So it just so there's three things. Number one, Cooper uses a bomb. It was supposed to be dynamite, right? McCoy was demolitions. Cooper has a tie with his tie clip. Now, I read that the FBI showed uh, McCoy, his, uh, McCoy's wife or daughter, the tie and tie clip. And they, they said that, yeah, that's what I bought him or the tie clip. I'm not sure if it was a tie and tie clip, but at least a tie clip. I think it that's was what, McCoy's sister-in-law. Sister, one of them, but they recognized it. Okay. So that's yeah. two. And so if, if Cooper's wants to leave him messages, right, that this is me, well, there's two things that tie to McCoy. The third thing is the Raleigh cigarettes. Now, yeah, Cooper could have been a, 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 a big smoker, chain smoker. But what if he's also doing it so much that it makes it so obvious what the name of the cigarettes are that they don't ever forget it? Because McCoy, he was married in Raleigh, North Carolina. So you got the Raleigh cigarettes, you got the tie and the tie clip, and you got the bomb for demolition. So there's three, they're, they're, they're the three big evidence things. So if you got Cooper saying, I'm going to leave you messages, you know it's going to me. Those are the three things McCoy would see as, uh, yeah, I know who did that hijacking. And I know how he did it. And then when, and then when you, go with Maca you go with Gossett, they're both Mormons, the Mormon upbringings for sure. I think Gossett got estranged from his family. I think, you know, when we go to that grudge part, I think uh, Gossett had issues with the Mormon. I think that's why he went to the Catholic, uh, become a Catholic priest. He was smoking and drinking. Uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly. It was like maybe one of his wives was Mormon. And so he converted to that for a while. Gossett? Yeah. No, no, no. His father and mother were, they were brought up uh, full Mormons. Oh, His really? Brothers. Wolfgang oh, was raised Mormon. Oh, full Mormon. Like, okay. The, if you read their uh, obituaries and that, the father, mother, like after he retired, they went on missions for the Mormons. Uh, they Can did you missionary. send that stuff to me, Robert? I will. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, they did. His brothers, the rest of his family were Mormons uh, and they stayed in the Mormon life. He didn't seem to. So I think at some point he got estranged from his family. I mean, both his brothers were, uh, what are they called? Polyglots. Like his one brother spoke like 14 languages and his other brother was a polyglot. So he spoke several, like, I mean, that's more than three and four languages, like eight or 10 languages they speak. So they were at, well, and we know McCoy was because he's a Sunday school teacher and didn't smoke or drink. Like McCoy didn't smoke or drink, so he can't be Cooper. It, right, I, I always bring that up with McCoy. If you're a non-smoker, yeah, I you dare you to smoke eight cigarettes in five hours. I oh. dare you to do that. You know, I was a teenager. The very first time I ever tried a cigarette in the basement friend's house, you know, in high school there. And I didn't smoke. They did. I said, so I tried it. One puff, one puff. And I was sick. I was coughing. It hurt. And that was, I never took another puff of a cigarette again. So if you don't smoke, you're not chain smoking. They, they would know you'd be coughing it's just a non-starter there. So that's why, you know, the thing is, but so they got both had family upbringings. There is, uh, who found it? Was it Nikki that found this? 
Now, this doesn't mean this is tied to these two families, but there, there is a, a, a gossip, uh, gossip McCoy marriage. I'm not sure if it's in Kentucky, but there is a, there is, I don't know. I haven't been able to trace it to these two yet, but there is that. Um, Damn, that would be amazing if you could. Yeah, I'm trying to, to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause if you, if somebody could produce a picture of Gossett and McCoy together, oh, then I'm a hundred percent sold oh, on Gossett with think, Cooper. It'd be all over. I think. Yeah. That's um, all I need. That will solve the case for me. Yeah. Uh, McCoy was in the national guard. Gossett's brother was in the national guard. Gossett's brother went to BIU. McCoy and his wife went to BYU. Just, just stuff like that. I think there's enough. And I think, I don't know anything about the Mormon religion. Lucky for you, I know a lot about it. Oh, do you? Yeah, I was raised Mormon. Oh, okay. Do you think, like in 19, it could be now or even 1971, it would be a closer community than like, say. Oh, 100%, even today. Um, Okay. If you are an active Mormon, and Mormonism tends to be you're either all in or all out. There's not a lot of room in the middle. Yeah. But if you are active, that is a very close community and most of the people that you meet and most of the people you associate with will be Mormon. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another, you know, especially 1971, it wasn't as many people on the earth as there is now. So it'd be even closer. Right. So there's uh, another, especially with Gossett's family being like full on Mormon, like parents and that and brothers as Mormon as you can get, I would say, um, you know, and McCoy doing Sunday school, it wouldn't be a hard stretch to think they intermingled at some point. I um, I love thinking exactly. about that idea because McCoy's skyjacking, it is so close to what Cooper did, so but cool. also he improved on a few things. So with that, I think it's not necessarily that McCoy would have done it differently. I like to think that McCoy got advice on here's what you need to do differently. I had no idea where I was going to land. You need to dictate the exact flight path. Yeah. They, they gave me parachutes, but they could have tracking devices in them. It's just a lot easier. Bring your own parachute on board. It's 1971. No one will notice somehow. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was just, it's just too close. The thing is too close, but if you look at the execution, Yep. The execution's wildly different because Cooper is calm, cool, and collected the entire time. And McCoy is a mess before the plane even takes off. Yeah, uh, that's just the personalities, yeah. what I meant to ask you this when we were going over your profile, but what does it tell you about the fact that he was reserved and controlled and calm the entire time? Because that's... When you think about this style heist, that's wildly different than what you would guess the person acted like. Yeah, that, and that's why I thought about him with some kind of a coven, you know, which which brings you to a religious upbringing. Just it just seemed like it was him. It just wasn't it wasn't an act. Like it wasn't something he just the way he is. It doesn't mean he wouldn't have been capable at at points of um, out like outbursts, like things build up just to let himself go. Cause some people do that. They're so calm all the time that they're taking stuff in. And then at, at one point things just explode. So he, he could have that kind of uh, demeanor with people like where he's just all of a sudden goes from zero to 10 and then you won't see it again for a year maybe. But uh, yeah, with that, with on the plane, that's what struck me is under that kind of uh, pressure and that, I mean, people think, well, okay, it's CIA or it's, he's had that much. Exp- I don't think, you know what, you're, you're hijacking innocent people. There's going to be some kind of tension. And for him to be that calm, that polite, that accommodating to them, that's just, that's not something he's acting. He's not, that's not an act. That's just, that's from within kind of thing. I think it had to do with his upbringing. And Why do you think so many people have confessed to this crime? I think it's just, natural and crimes like this like everybody thinks you know it's their aunt or their uncle or well not it's my aunt or my uncle i mean we have multiple deathbed confessions we have larry carr even told us about multiple people 
going into the FBI to confess to the crime, which is wild. Yeah, I mean, there's been studies on that. People do that. I don't know why they just, you know, there's either uh, mental health issues or uh, they want the, the limelight or just, I mean, lots of studies done on that for people confessing to things they didn't do just happens, you know, big case. People want notoriety or um, maybe some people probably even believe they actually were, you know, if they have mental health issues, it's just, that's why I think people get off. I mean, go to the point to say, well, that's fine. If anybody confessed, it's not him. That's, you can't look at it like that. <laughs> it's just, you know, like what did it take uh, Edison and the light bulb or, or that saying, you know, like 990 times he got it wrong. He's only got to get it right once. So there's only got to be one right person with a confession. And, and the way Gossett did it, it brings true to me, you know, not, and then when there's deathbed confessions and there's only one person, well, how do you really know um, what the confession was unless it was recorded or there was two or three people? Uh, I know that's one thing I know Larry Carr says about why he believes he's never confessed to somebody because it's, if you tell one person, then you've kind of told everybody because people usually spread it around. But the way Gossett did it, he did it in a way where it wasn't going to be, he didn't just tell any Tom, Dick or Harry. He told two lawyers who weren't going to spread it around. Then he told his sons and his sons. Do you know the names of the lawyers he told? No, not off the top of my head. But you've seen the names? I have. Yeah. I've Uh, I've seen at least one of them. Have you tried to reach out to either of them? No, I think I've tried looking them up, but I haven't found them. I haven't uh, gotten that far yet. I've been really trying to get a hold of Galen. I've I've gotten a hold of uh, Clyde Lewis, and he's been trying to get a hold of him for me, but I haven't heard back. And uh, I asked Bruce too, and I haven't heard back from Bruce. So I don't know if, like you said, Galen just doesn't want to, because I'd, I'd like, to, what all I want from Galen would be to say, listen, do you, do you have something that eliminates this guy, period? You know, save me my, <laughs> save me some time in that, you know, like, cause there isn't anything and that you don't have to tell me anything you have on him. I just want to know, do you have something that you know for a fact eliminates them that wouldn't be too hard to let somebody know yeah it's because of this you know i don't think galen has that i would be no. more interested <laughs> in some of the other stuff galen has oh, oh definitely definitely but like but i said it's I just try it. the the confession to these two lawyers yeah why haven't we heard from them no they're lawyers they people like that well galen's also a lawyer yeah yeah but i guess they have a Gossett didn't confess to him, right? So, I mean, lawyers have their ethical things. I mean, I'm sure <clears throat> Gossett probably wasn't their client for them to say, you know, client privilege, but still they're lawyers. They don't, I, I, I fully see them doing exactly what they've done. Don't want to hear about it or don't talk about it. That's my advice. I mean, lawyers, there was, uh, which I'm not sure which lawyer it was, uh, famous one now, um, lady. Anyway, she was talking about a client she had, and he was, I think it was like a serial killer. And she knew, but she couldn't say anything. And she wouldn't say anything until he died. And then she was able to come out with it. So lo- lawyers are pretty, they stick to their, their uh, whatever compass they use, you know, like. Yeah, but both games long dead. Yeah, but they just, they're still lawyers. I think if they, if they break that thing with him, it's like a probably like a non-written rule kind of thing. You know? I don't know. I think he wanted this to come out after he died because of the way he told people. I, I, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. And I think he told his lawyers, you know, told lawyers specifically because people would trust him. Like if they're lawyers, right? He dies and they come out with it. Well, they're going to be a lot more believable than some drunk at a bar who said, I heard gossip talking about this. So why they haven't come out, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody's got to them and said, hey, don't talk about it. Stuff like that happens. Or they could have just be who they are and are, aren't, aren't talking about it. Because they, well, they, have, they have a confession, but they don't have any actual proof, right? They just have the guy that came to them. So I'm sure they're weighing a lot of different things 
What? I'm Are tempted still- to tell you a <clears throat> secret that I know. Yeah. Oh, I'm good with secrets. I keep secrets. Trust me. I don't, I don't ever talk about anything. So hopefully no one listens <laughs> to this part, but I let's see how vague I could be about this. I heard a rumor mm-hmm. that there was a gossip book that was being written in like 2010 ish. Okay. Um, by a, a very credible reporter in Portland. Yeah. And it was shelved for some reason. And it drives me crazy that. I cannot get to the bottom of that. I've even reached out to that reporter multiple times and never got a response back. And then recently I reached out to him and I was like, hey, I'm just going to start running my mouth about this rumor unless you get back to me. (laughs) And he responded to me and said, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. And that was it. Not... Hey, by the way, you punk kid, I didn't write any <laughs> book about gossip. Yeah, didn't deny it. Yeah, I mean, Robert, if you ask me right now if I wrote a book about Transformers, I yeah. could clearly tell you, no, I did not. Right. Um, did I work on a secret project about Jimmy Hoffa that never came out? No, I did not. Yeah. But if you ask me about a secret project I worked on and I just say, I don't know who you are. Yeah. that's 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 what i said there it's sometimes not what they're saying it's what they're not saying exactly and i wish i could say that was exclusive to gossip but i've also experienced that with a couple other suspects but it's one of the reasons i can't leave gossip alone and when nikki told me he was like oh you got to talk to this guy robert he's a gossip guy instantly i was like okay i'm in because there isn't anyone else to talk to about gossip. No, not like this. Yeah, I haven't found one either. No, there, there's probably like five people on the planet who could talk about Wolfgang uh, as long as we have. And yeah. two of them are his sons. One is Galen and you and I are the other two. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It makes you wonder. I mean, Galen's silence all of a sudden is just, yeah, it makes you wonder. Like, I mean, if it wasn't anything big, he could just come out and say yeah, I found something or or whatever, but just seems like there's something more going on. And the reporter may or may not have been ghostwriting it for yep. one of the lawyers that Gossett yep. confessed to. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. We could talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Outside of a recorded <laughs> conversation, if you want. I hear you. Oh, I'd love it. Yeah. Because I did. I, I don't consider myself a researcher in this case Mm -hmm. i'm not necessarily actively trying to solve this i'm not researching suspects yeah um but i talk to a lot of people that are and there have only been a few times where something really piqued my interest to the point where i'm like i gotta look into that myself and and definitely gossip was the one that i went hardest into personally And I just reached that point, you know, like I told you, just no responses, dead ends, and then vague, not even a denial, just go away. Yeah. And just tell me, no, I would have walked away. I'm not like, okay, well, the guy said, the guy said no. So that's it. That's the end of it. That's how I would have handled it. (laughs) Instead of now I have to sit here like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, exactly. Why, why didn't that book come out? That's, I mean, was it terrible? Uh, did they find something out? Uh, was there a disagreement? Maybe they couldn't get financing for it. I, I, I just, I want to know. Oh, and exactly. I would read it. Yeah. If there is a partial transcript of that book, or if there is a completed book of that, I would, I would take out a second mortgage to read that. Keep going. Keep talking. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but. It's just. Like you said, you can't disprove gossip. There just seems to be so much that supports him. But like a couple of other suspects in this, it's not that they can't be ruled out. It's that you can't prove that it was that it was him. 
Yeah, yeah. Just no smoking gun. All right, let me ask you a, a different question here. Uh, normally, I'd ask, why doesn't this case get the attention it deserves? But with that Netflix special out now, I would say it does. But I want to ask you, in the true crime community, the audience leans heavily female. But in this case in particular, it's all dudes. It's, I mean, if I look at my audience on on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, it's men. It, it's 95% men. When I go to CooperCon and look around the room, it's, it's dudes. Yeah. Why does this case only appeal or primarily appeal to men? I guess just because of what he'd done. Just it, every guy would probably want to do that. You know, like just cool what he did. I mean, it, it's a crime. Thank God he didn't hurt anybody. I don't think is that he would ever intended to hurt anybody, but just the whole thing, it's almost like a James Bond kind of thing and, and uh, just appeals to guys. Yeah, I think that's true. The, the, you know, the fact that he didn't physically hurt anyone, it does yeah. let, you, let you root for him. What is it that, is it West Hollywood that, that armed shootout in the, in the nineties in California? Yeah. That thing was totally cool until they started murdering cops. Um, then yeah then it's not really cool anymore. But with, with Cooper, there isn't that part where he shot a bunch of policemen or he threw the stewardess off the back stairs. No. So no. you and he was extra root for him. I mean, he was extra polite. He got the, the crew meals. Like, I mean, who does that in that situation? I mean, just a totally different type of, type of thing. And a lot of people think he's sticking it to the man. So... Yeah, the only victims are an insurance company and an airline. And yeah. nobody has any sympathy for no. either of those companies. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, Tina and them were left with, uh, I mean, could affect it to her her whole life. That Because afterwards, right, you'd be going into shock. Well, you're in the situation. You're dealing with it. You're dealing with it the best you can. But then afterwards, you look back and think, he could have blown us up. I could have been dead. I mean, it just must throw them, especially Tina, for a loop. Like it could be something you just don't get over because it would go over in your mind because she doesn't know the bomb's not real, right? Could have been real. I don't think it was because the way he handled it, but she doesn't know that. She thinks one one wrong step and, and the plane's gone and then they're down. So coming that close to death in their mind is, you know, that could be pretty traumatic. But I, I mean, again, Cooper, he wouldn't have thought of that. He wasn't that still would have entered his mind. That's what, how he was affecting them. Right. Yeah. I mean, just based on the fact he get, he ordered meals for the flight crew. He tried to tip <laughs> the stewardesses for his drinks. Yeah. Uh, this oh, isn't I, the kind of guy who was thinking uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to kill these people. No, no, he's not. He's not a, a gentleman killer. Like I mean, there's gotta be, they gotta come out with a real good movie about him. Cause it could, someone could write a real good movie. The Wolfgang Gossett story by Robert Fuller. <laughs> Yeah, I just I really don't get why I guess they just they have to go on to other suspects, but I don't know how people haven't done more of a deep dive into gossip and like the matchbook thing. It wasn't too hard to find out. You just got to, you know, you got to think what does what's Cooper doing? What are his actions? What's important to him? And then go from there and then, you know, finding out the ICS matchbook. I mean, that's huge. I should have, should have been, I mean, the FBI should have been able to do that. They would have had the evidence. Like, I don't know how they don't, not that they could have related it to Gossett at that time, but even when Gossett came on the picture, how did they not look at things? I mean, I've been doing it four months and I found a couple of things. So you can't tell me their, you know, career FBI people can't uh, find some stuff if they really wanted to, especially with Greg's story. How do you not take that and run with it? At least, run it with as much as you can. He's got one of the best stories of any of the suspects. So yeah, just something just doesn't make sense other than who he was and the FBI giving him accommodation. They would just say, I mean, the upper people would, uh, that, that was a, that was a, to close the case, that was a, uh, that was a decision from high above, high above to close a case like that publicly. I mean, the guy who announced it, yeah. I don't, I don't see it being his decision, even though he might have ran that office. They just, for some reason, they didn't gossip fits. I don't know if there's any other subject that any other suspect that we know of 
that would cause them to want to close the case if that's why they close the case, other than maybe Raxaw, but I, he didn't do it. So, well, if somebody wants to help you solve this thing and prove it was Gossa, is there somewhere they can uh, they can talk to you? Yeah, you, they can email me. We can start with that. I like to start with an email because, you know, I get a good. One thing I'm able to do, whether it's a gift or not, I don't know. Is when people write things, I get a I get a good feel for them, just the way they write, the words they use. Uh, like someone sent me, they had a suspect. Someone sent me a couple of uh, newspaper clippings of what this person wrote um, from back in the '70s or whatever, <clears throat> and they asked me to uh, if I could check it out against my profile, what I thought, and all I had was two two little, you know, newspaper clippings, didn't know anything about the person, uh, who he was, name or any, like anything, personality or anything. All I had these two newspaper clippings. And so I messaged the person back because they really thought this person was Cooper. And I said, uh, it doesn't match Cooper's profile. It's not his personality, at least from my, pro and, and if you're asking me, um, it's, it's, not, it's not close to Cooper, it's not him. And then I got a little, kind of arg not argument back but the person had said they uh, they had they had been talking to the the suspect's grandson their suspect's grandson and my my view of uh this person was a bit off my judgment of them and i said well i don't think so because you're asking me and i, and I can tell from this some of what this person is from their writing the words you're using and like I'm not sure how a grandson would know what their grandfather was like back in 1971. Like I, I didn't know. I knew my grandfather, loved him, but I really didn't know who who the people he hung around with, you know, when I wasn't born and all that. <clears throat> and so then, probably a half hour after that discussion, after I said it wasn't Cooper, and and this person really thought he had Cooper, I got a message back saying, "Well, he's definitely not Cooper." <laughs> he said he says because he found out he didn't smoke so he's eliminated but that just shows you how people are so you know they get so honed in on a suspect they miss the little things but then you ask me and i can tell you from a writing at least my view of cooper you know nobody says i'm right but just from what i see of his personality it wasn't in his writing so i like when people email it gives me a good idea of who do you have an email you want to share yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, catcon.rf, which is K A T as in Tom, O N as in Nancy, dot R F at gmail.com. And then you're also on the DB Cooper Mystery Group? Yeah, 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 I'm on that. And uh, I am on the other one too, but I'm under the name Jack under that one because I that's the first site that I joined on this D.B. Cooper thing, so. <clears throat> and you're Jack uh, on the D.B. Cooper forum? Yeah, yeah. I just put Jack. I wasn't uh, know if I was supposed to put my name or or what, so I just put Jack. Um, but I am Robert Fuller on the other one. Good deal. Was there anything we didn't cover? No. Oh, I'll probably think about it afterwards. As soon as we hang up, I'll go, crap. <laughs> no, I, no, I think, uh, no, I think we pretty... I'm surprised I remembered as much as I wanted to. So maybe we'll do it again in four months when you've solved this thing. Yeah, well, you can you can solve it. Need help from Canada though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to hear back from Greg whether his dad still has stuff around. Like, I, I think Cooper still got boxes or some people should be. He saved he saved everything. I think Cooper did. So if he made it to the ground with everything, he saved he saved stuff. There, there's evidence out there whether it's buried or somewhere or storage closet or somewhere or somebody has stuff in a box in an attic. It could be even, it, it could be even jotted down and they don't really understand it. it could be mumbo jumbo to them, but there's stuff out there. All right. Well, if you're listening to this, go look for it. And Robert, yeah. thank you for coming on the show. It's great to talk to you. You too. Thanks very much. You can find Robert on the D.B. Cooper Mystery Group on Facebook, or you can email him catcon.rf at gmail.com. You'll find links to it all in the show notes. Do you know who D.B. Cooper was? 
Did your great grandpa leave you a stack of 1969 $20 bills? Would you like a chance to present your case? Hit us up. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or email us dbcooperpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Robert Fuller for doing the work on Wolfgang. Thank you to Darian Osadich for letting us use his work. Thank you to Russell Colbert for doing all my work. I'm Darren Schaefer, and thank you for listening to The Cooper Vortex. Here's a story we all know About a man many years ago I jacked a plane so we were told then he jumped into the cold Wrapped a bourbon and a cigarette In the air the stage is set Polite and kind the people say It's time to make his getaway This is how the story goes About the money and the man D.B. Cooper they call me now Catch me if you can In his coat built tight He's got enough to change his life Where he landed no one knows But from his tale a legend grows Was a cold dark rainy night As he walked he saw light Held his cash close to his side he Just needs to catch a ride this is how the story goes about the money and the man. D.B. Cooper, they call me now. Catch me if you can. Cooper's done running now, he was 80.